Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Tim Anderson. He is a writer, academic, and director of the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies. His books include The Dirty War on Syria and Axis of Resistance. Tim Anderson, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. So I want to have you on because right now the major flashpoint globally is Ukraine with a major standoff between the U.S. and Russia there. But in the process, Syria is overlooked. And even though the decade-long dirty war has wound down, it's still continuing by other means. The U.S. has a occupation of U.S. troops there, which does not get covered very much in the Western media. The U.S. is still maintaining the harshest sanctions in the world on Syria that are causing major deprivations. And still you have... Uh, Russia is still there. You still have Iranian-backed forces there. And you have Israel uh, periodically bombing Syria, including most recently in Latakia, which is another thing that just does not get reported, these constant Israeli strikes on Syria. You were just there for a period of three months, I believe. And I'm just curious, your impression of where Syria stands today, how you're thinking about Syria and what the state of is it, and what the state of it is right now under U.S. occupation and part of the country in the Northeast and under these crippling sanctions? Yes. So in general, I think um, we can say that Syria today, early 2022, is has largely defeated the proxy war that was carried out by the U.S. for the last decade or so. The only remaining pockets of terrorism are in and around the safe havens created by two, the two biggest NATO powers, Turkey in the US and Israel in the South. So in other words, the circumstances are changed considerably from when the UN Security Council resolution of 2015 said uh, there is no military solution, there has to be a political solution, we'll try and uh, broker it through a, a UN Geneva process. That's what makes that look very artificial now, because, of course, since 2015, many things have changed. The Syrians with their allies, in particular Russia and Iran, as you mentioned, have liberated Aleppo, Palmyra, Deir ez-Zor, Daraa in the south, a third of Idlib and so on. So it's just the safe havens for terrorism and, uh, let's say, other proxies um, uh, created by the NATO powers and by Israel that remains the, the military obstacle there. However, of course, the economic war is also very powerful. And I would just add here that I think it's proper to call the unilateral coercive measures that the US imposes, the US and the European Union to a, to a fair degree, imposes as illegal siege warfare measures or in international law parlance, by and large, they're unilateral coercive measures. Because, And the reason for making that distinction is there is such a thing in international law as sanctions for example, which were imposed on apartheid South Africa in the 80s, for example, and it's important to maintain that sort of distinction. Uh, so the economic warfare on Syria, as you said, is extremely harsh, but it's really um, something that's imposed on virtually all the independent states and peoples of the region, from Palestine through Lebanon um, and Iraq and Iran and, and Yemen, for example. There, there are widespread unilateral coercive measures, siege measures on that region, particularly on the independent states. I'm curious how, you know, from what you witnessed when you were there in Syria, how sanctions are having an impact. When I visited, I didn't get to tour the whole country. I was basically in Damascus and the surrounding areas. And I saw real hardship and people complained bitterly about the impact of U.S. sanctions on their lives. Uh, one stat I wanted to read you is that uh, this is from a uh, recent article in Foreign Affairs. It says that in 2020, food prices rose 236%. When you were there, can you talk to us a bit about you know what you witnessed at the micro level about how sanctions are having an impact? Yes, there's no doubt that the uh, unilateral coercive measures, the siege warfare, the economic warfare has imposed incredible hardships there. The currency is depreciated by seven times uh, in the last three years, for example. Um, and that's linked to the, uh, the financial collapse in Lebanon and the third party uh, unilateral measures imposed by the Trump administration and maintained by the, the Biden administration. So you've got uh, common wages there for those who have work uh, in the order of something like 70 or 80,000 lira a month, which is about 20 or 25 US dollars a month. Now, Syria has some advantages there in the sense that there is a state sector which provides free health, but that's 
sector has been undermined. Um, there is subsidised food and fuel, for example, which doesn't exist in Lebanon, which to get IMF loans, all the subsidy structures have to be destroyed. So there's that difference between the two countries. But there is extreme hardship in the country. There's also increasing inequality. This is one of the sad things about a lot of war situations. Some people make money out of war, and that's happening in Syria to a degree too. But at the mass level, people are very poor. They're surviving somehow. Um, it, it's extremely difficult, though. Um, it's, it, there's extreme pressure. And, of course, that pressure is helping force a restructure of the economic relations of the region because, as I said, it's not just Syria. It's Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, um, and the, the other independent states and peoples, Palestine and Yemen, for example, that are under this sort of pressure. There recently was this agreement that Jordan helped facilitate where whereby uh, Syria would help transfer energy from Egypt to Lebanon, which is going through an energy crisis. And there was a major uproar about this from war hawks and neocons in Washington, uh, anger that the Biden administration didn't step in to stop that, as if, of course, the Biden administration has the right to stop countries of the Middle East from making agreements to uh, share and supply energy. Has that deal gone through? Uh, has has energy started flowing to Lebanon uh, via Syria? Uh, not yet, um, but it's something that made use of the so-called Arab pipeline, which is something that goes from Egypt through to Jordan, has a branch into Israel, by the way, which is a source of controversy now in Lebanon, because in Lebanon now there's a controversy about whether the Lebanese are going to be importing Egyptian gas or whether it's going to be Israeli gas because there's a link in there. And, of course, Jordan itself, is a, there's a regime in Jordan which uh, collaborates very closely with Israel. So uh, it's created new polemics for, uh, Jordan, uh, for Lebanon. But because the pipeline crosses Syria, the Biden administration had to uh, create some exemptions in terms of its own laws or, you know, the, the so-called... Caesar sanctions, the third party measures put in place by the Trump administration, uh, which were really uh, just mainly aimed at third parties, mainly aimed at penalising other countries that uh, did business with Syria. So uh, the Biden administration made an exemption for that and then also uh, to allow the uh, Jordania, a, a Lebanese delegation to visit their neighbour. And, and this is the strange thing about Lebanon now that they will say, well, the Americans have to give the Lebanese permission to go and talk to their neighbours, the Syrians. This is the bizarre situation there. Um, then, of course, Jordan itself um, has begun doing substantial commerce with Syria and Syria has a trade surplus in, in that situation there. The Emirates also have, have begun to invest in Syria, although they normalised four years ago. And when they did that, the Trump administration used it against them um, to force them to normalise with Israel. So there's a there's a play going on there, which is really the consequence of um, the US trying to micromanage this enormous web of unilateral coercive measures, the siege measures they have in place on the whole region. I just want to st stress one point you made about the Caesar Act, these uh, US sanctions that went into effect in June 2020, overwhelming bipartisan support in Congress. They don't just sanction Syria. They punish any entity, government, corporation in the world that does business with Syria in, in, in any way. And uh, I want to play for you a clip, actually, of one of the key architects of the Trump administration's Syria policy, Joel Rayburn, who was the uh, U.S. special envoy for Syria. And he bragged about how basically the Caesar Act just lowered the bar for the U.S. to be able to sanction pretty much anyone they wanted who has anything to do with Syria. This is what he said. Sanctions normally, you know, for those who, who worked um, in, the, in the government have had experience with sanctions, oftentimes there can be a very high hurdle for the evidence uh, that, you have to, um, uh, that you have to gather in order to uh, uh, prove legal sufficiency under certain sanctions authorities. Um, the Caesar Act really lowers the bar for us. Uh, we don't have to prove, for example, that a company that's going in to do a reconstruction project in the Damascus region um, is dealing directly with uh, the Assad regime. We don't have to have the evidence to prove that link. We just have to have the evidence that proves that a company or an individual is investing in that sector, in the construction sector, the engineering sector, 
um, most of the aviation sector, finance sector, uh, energy sector, and, and so on. So that's Joel Rayburn. He's bragging there that the U.S. doesn't even have to prove that any entity that it's sanctioning even has some kind of remote tie to the Syrian government. As long as they can prove that they're in any sector that's involved in the Syrian economy, that's sufficient to sanction them. Yes, that's the logic within the U.S. system, isn't it? Um, it's a logic within the U.S. system, and it's a logic as applies to third parties, because, of course, there were already uh, economic siege measures, unilateral coercive measures against Syria well before that, uh, almost a decade before that. Um, this law is quite similar to the Helms-Burton law imposed in the 90s on Cuba, which had very strong third-party sanctions, but which weren't really brought into play very strongly until the Obama administration, uh, not in Bush the second, but in the Obama administration from uh, from the early years, there the Obama administration started to impose fines, quote unquote, on mainly European banks that were doing business with Iran and Cuba, and it amounted to billions of dollars. So uh, more or less, an economic war extended to the the so-called allies of the U.S. And according to the terms of U.S. law, which is not really binding on anyone except to the extent that they're economically blackmailed into it or uh, the U.S. diplomats would say, well, if you want to do business with Iran or Cuba, forget your business in the U.S. So this is part of the consequences of the U.S. exporting its exceptionalist law to the rest of the world. And the general problem that's created, uh, I would say, is that um, let's remember the whole project for the U.S. being in uh, West Asia, or what they call CENTCOM under under Pentagon terms, um, or West Asia is the central part of that CENTCOM designation, is that the the aim to take over the region, to dominate the Middle East, let's say, with its lieutenants Israel and the Saudis, was specifically to exclude the other big powers, or 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 to avoid the construction of other poles of power led by Iran, for example, to exclude or impose conditions on the entry of China and Russia. But what they have done is entirely the reverse. They are forcing the entire region into the arms of Russia and China um, and reinforcing that which they set out a project to prevent in the first place. So this is one of the extraordinary dialectics of this extreme economic warfare and another comment i'd make on that finally is just that in some ways it's an antithesis to the the liberal order or the neoliberal order which the anglo-americans had carried out for such a long time do you remember all the, the phrases about free trade and open markets and all those sorts of things there are so many dozens of countries now subject to this economic warfare that we are no longer living in that sort of uh, it was never really a, a genuine liberal world, but the pretext of it being a liberal world has disappeared with the advent of these extreme um, economic restrictions and economic sieges. On your point about you know the U.S. aim in Syria and the broader Middle East uh, being to ensure U.S. dominance of the region, let me quote you someone who agrees with you, and that's the former another former senior Trump administration official for Syria policy, James Jeffrey, who was the envoy to the so-called anti-ISIS coalition. And he wrote this recently. He said, Washington must finally grasp that Iranian and Russian strategic success in Syria, coming on the heels of the Afghan pullout, would endanger the decades-long American regional security system and the general security which it has provided. Usually we hear when the U.S. talks about Syria, we want to bring freedom and democracy, human rights. But that right there is a pretty blunt admission of what the real agenda is. Yeah, the, the interventions in Syria in particular, but also Libya, were initially based on this idea of humanitarian intervention. There was some crisis which this so-called responsibility to protect had to intervene on humanitarian grounds. That was replaced to a large extent uh, a little bit later on by this responsibility to protect against terrorism. But of course, uh, we know, not least from the admissions of senior U.S. officials and quite a number of senior U.S. officials, that the U.S. and its allies have been the principal funders and armors of all the terrorist groups in the region, precisely to destabilize the region and weaken the regimes, first of all in Baghdad and then in um, in Damascus. So, you know, for example, that uh, DIA 
a memo from mid 2012 which said that they foresaw that the, the the Syrian insurgency was led by extremists and they foresaw the rise of a Salafist principality an Islamic state in eastern Syria and that was quote exactly unquote what the US and its allies wanted in order to isolate the Damascus regime so all of this notion of the US fighting ISIS is has always been rubbish effectively. It's been, ISIS has been a tool, still is to a much lesser degree for the destabilization of Syria and Iraq, and importantly, to prevent the linking up and the, 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 the strengthening bonds between the neighbors, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And initially it was ISIS. Now, of course, there is this Kurdish proxy force also, which is used for that purpose with its headquarters in Erbil in North Iraq and making attacks on Iran using uh, Iranian Kurdish groups and um, helping the US try and um, fragment and keep, uh, carve off a slice of Syria in the Northeast of Syria. And on that point about ISIS being a, a tool for the US, I mean, nobody put it more bluntly than John Kerry, who admitted in a leaked recording that the US sat back and sat back and watched as ISIS was approaching on Damascus, and the hope was, Kerry explained, that ISIS's surge in Syria could be used as leverage for the U.S. to basically impose regime change on Assad and force him to leave. Let's uh, watch the clip. The reason Russia came in is because ISIL was getting stronger. Daesh was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth. And that's why Russia came in, because they didn't want a Daesh government. And they supported Assad, and and uh, and we know that this was this was growing. We were watching. We saw that that Daesh was growing in strength, and we thought Assad was threatened. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage. Uh, you know that Assad might then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, you got Assad. Now you got the Putin. The, Supported. So that's Kerry, again, putting it very bluntly. Yes, I think um, that just simply reinforces um, the other admissions by senior U.S. officials. The uh, Flynn in the DIA 2012 said uh, 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 a Salafist principality in Islamic State was exactly what they wanted in Syria. Um, in 2014, uh, Biden as vice president and Martin Dempsey, as head of the military, said all their close allies were financing all of the terrorist groups, including ISIS or ISIL. Our biggest problem is our allies. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks were great friends, and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. The Saudis, the Emiratis, etc. What were they doing? They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni-Shia war, what did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad, except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Well, do you know any major Arab ally that embraces ISIL? I know major Arab allies who fund them. Yeah, but did they embrace that? They fund them because the Free Syrian Army couldn't have fight Assad. They were trying to beat Assad. I think they realized the folly of their ways. Let's don't taint the Mideast unfairly. And they admitted that. And, of course, the U.S. doesn't allow its allies to uh, arm and finance its enemies. It, it, they require permission for that. There's an institution specifically for uh, the re-export of U.S. weaponry, for example, you know. So there are multiple admissions from U.S. officials, uh, even though the, the 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 pretext was has been maintained to this day that somehow the U.S. is fighting ISIS in the region. Uh, all of the players in the region, and we know from the admissions of U.S. officials that they have been using from the beginning ISIS as a tool. I reported last year at my Substack that for all the claim about the U.S. fighting ISIS in Syria airstrikes by the U.S. against ISIS uh, for the last known period that there that statistics were kept have, ba have basically reduced to a trickle to, at some points, no more than two per month. 
So this claim that they're fighting ISIS is undermined by their own statistics uh, quietly released by the Pentagon. You mentioned China. So let me ask you about that. Recently, there was this announcement that Syria has joined the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China's uh, massive economic infrastructure project around the world. Now, there's been talk before about China coming in with massive investment in Syria. And from what I understand, that didn't materialize. So is this any different? Is the Syria officially joining the BRI mark a significant development? Yes, it does. Um, it's a, You're right, it's been coming slowly and the Chinese have been cautious. And as we all know, the Chinese are look at the long game. They're not really looking for a quick, um, a quick kill in terms of business, but of course they have business interests. And the Belt and Road Initiative is about infrastructure. It's also about trade and investment. And this MOU signed earlier this month, January 2022, is uh, specifically for Syria and extends what they had already done in terms of the feelers they put out in Syria in terms of the strategic agreement they have with Iran, which includes reconstruction in um, neighbouring states, including Iraq and Syria specifically. So it's been coming for a while, and I guess you might say that the Chinese have been waiting for the security situation to stabilise. And it has stabilised in, in Syria. The, the key weapon of warfare, the, the key leverage that the US has is now its economic warfare, basically. And so it, there's no doubt that um, the US uh, strategy of trying to starve Syria and other states into submission is having this effect. They, they are uh, strengthening the hand of both Russia and China in the region. They are helping forge those alliances um, to the east and to the north. And, of course, you would have seen that um, earlier last year, Iran joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is um, a huge regional bloc. So that's, uh, that's very important. And, of course, in financial areas, this is um, a critical area because the US, in a sense, is no longer the leader in, in, in industry and trade. But in finance, the US has a very strong grip still, particularly through the SWIFT system and the use of the dollar. But there are some initiatives in train now with Iran and Syria and um, with the digital yuan in China, which are eventually going to overtake and at least provide an alternative to the US dollar dominance. I don't know how much China fears U.S. sanctions, if it does at all in Syria. But, I mean, from your reading, do you think China is willing to risk facing U.S. sanctions un under the Caesar Act and all of its various companies and entities that could be affected by it? Well, I think any reluctance that the Chinese had has been whittled away by the aggression shown against China by U.S. administrations, notably with the Trump administration, but great continuity in the Biden administration there. Uh, it's true to say that China for a long time had this codependency with the US, that is to say it, it was making a lot of money out of the US, had a huge trade surplus for many, many years, decades really. Um, and when the US decided on its mercantile approach to China and you know to block uh, Chinese technology and so on, when it decided on that route, I think it stiffened up the resolve of China to... Uh, to move uh, in more with its own in its own direction and, and in line with its own strategies, in particular the the eastward move. This is something which uh, the Belt and Road Initiative or the links between Asia and Europe are really a key to the anxiety of U.S. policymakers. I believe. I mean, it's no accident that the interventions in between Asia and Europe, uh, all through West Asia, you know, including Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Iran. Um, Syria, Iraq, uh, and so on, and Yemen, uh, right in the middle of that nexus and, and uh, important parts of the future Belt and Road Initiative by China. So the, the great game that's sitting over the top of all of these wars in the region is indeed that, that struggle for control of those regions. And I don't think in terms of uh, US law is becoming much, much less uh, of uh, import to the Chinese, because after all, they are the center of global production and indeed most technology innovation is moving in their direction. So let me ask you about Israel. As I mentioned earlier, one of Israel's most recent bombings of Syria, among many over the past decade, hundreds of Israeli bombings of Syria, came against Latakia, the port of Latakia, bombing a commercial port. The targets included powdered milk. Buildings were shattered nearby, uh, including uh, the window of a nearby hospital. One criticism that 
uh, Russia has gotten is that Russia maintains these close ties with Israel, but has done nothing, at least that the public can see, to stand in the way of these periodic bombings of its ally, uh, the Syrian government. Can you talk us about what's going on there, why Russia has not more forcefully intervened to uh, stop Israeli bombings, and w why is Israel bombing Syria so much? W what motivates their desire to bomb Syria hundreds of times, including a commercial port? Okay, well, let's start with the Israelis. The Israelis, as I said at the beginning, are uh, central to creating a safe haven for the terrorism, the proxy militias used to, uh, if not uh, carry out regime change in Syria, to destroy the state, to break it up into fragments and you know, to carve off a fragment for themselves. So there's been very close coordination for many years between the actions of the uh, armed groups in Syria and uh, Israeli bombing. Um, also, of course, remember that the Israelis are very anxious about the um, the prospect of having what they call sometimes an Iranian land bridge, that is to say the allies of the independent countries there, Lebanon, uh, the, in the south of Lebanon, Hezbollah, in Syria, the many of the Iraqi militia and the Iranians in a strong alliance on what they consider as their borders or the occupied Jolan in the first instance. And it's no secret that there is very close military coordination between all of those partners. And in the case of Syria, it's certainly the case, uh, it's no secret that Syria is um, a site for manufacturing and storage of missiles that Hezbollah uses. And so in some respects, the Israeli as reckless and as criminal as it is, the attacks the Israelis make on some of the areas near Damascus Airport, some of the military bases in Syria, and some of the ports on the Syrian coast, uh, an anxiety about components coming in from Iran, um, and perhaps the storage of those components on the coast. But, um, uh, you know, uh, as you pointed out, they've, their targets haven't been very impressive, basically. Um, there is that close nexus between the resistance in Lebanon and Syria and Iran, and that's not going away. Similar, we could say the same thing, by the way, about Israeli and US attacks on the one border crossing between Syria and Iraq, which is controlled by Syria and Iraq and Iran, down at al Bukamal, and also that, that recent massacre at al Baghuz, which the New York Times wrote about, that was significant too, because the US, in, in many respects, controls the rest of the border between, and the border crossings between Iraq and Syria. So that's from the Israeli side. Now, from the Russian part of the question, you asked, why has Russia not done more? Of course, it's it's a very common question. And um, I don't think it's quite right to say they've done nothing. The Russians, of course, have provided the Syrians with weaponry, most of the Syrian army's weaponry, the Syrian Air Force is Russian. Um, they have also helped in training and upgrading of Syrian air defences, even if the Syrians do not have the state-of-the-art S-400 Russian air defences, those are used just to protect the Russian assets in uh, the Russian bases, in the naval base and the air bases. Um, but um, behind the scenes, you can see that the effectiveness of Syrian air defence has improved in recent years. In, in many respects, this sort of uh, multiple, as you say, hundreds of Israeli attacks, unprovoked attacks on Syria, are helping train the Syrians in their own defence. Now, uh, above and beyond that, it's true that Russia has different interests to Syria, and this has been recognised openly by the Syrians, by the head of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, he's pointed out, he said, look, the, the Russians are our allies uh, when it comes to fighting terrorism in Syria. When it comes to Israel, it's a different story. The Russians have a different strategic relationship with Israel. Um, it's an open secret that one faction of the oligarchy in Russia is closely tied into Israel, including investments in Israel. So that's simply a contradiction that um, the system has to live with. And I think the resistance groups understand that fairly, fairly well. But I, I think some people get a little bit anxious and say that uh, Russia should, should uh, escalate the war and uh, crush Israel for attacking Syria are uh, being a little bit unrealistic. There are different interests there. Of course, Russia has its own interests in relation to Turkey too, which is another extreme sore point. Both Russia's relationship with Turkey and Russia's relationship with Israel are sore points in Syria. Amongst the Syrian military, you'll sometimes hear uh, a concern also expressed about the fact that 
when um, ceasefire deals are cut in certain parts of Syria after they've managed to get rid of the, the terrorist groups in certain areas, like in Daraa, for example, or in Idlib, then the Russians will cut some deal, um, a deal in which the Syrian army is not involved, even though the Syrian army is carrying all the sacrifices, for example, for uh, liberating areas like Daraa and, and Idlib but the Russians will cut some deal with Turkey because there's a strategic relationship between Russia and Turkey there. So it is a sore point in Syria, but I don't think it's fair to say that the Russians are doing nothing. You mentioned the New York Times reporting on this U.S. massacre in the Syrian town of Baguz. Let me just explain what that is for people who missed the story. In late 2021, in, in November, the Times revealed that in 2019, uh, the uh, U- a U.S. special forces unit in the U.S. military massacred about 80 Syrian civilians who were taking shelter from an offensive against the Islamic State. And they had video of the massacre, but it was completely covered up. And it only came to light uh, more than two years later after some whistleblowers spoke out, um, including to Congress, which is a pretty extraordinary story. It's a rare case of U.S. atrocities in Syria coming to light. Although I have to note a few things. I don't think we'll be seeing any exposés in the Times anytime soon, at least, of massacres committed by U.S.-backed forces, you know, armed under the CIA Timber Sycamore program. And we'll also see no stories in the New York Times about whistleblowers from the OPCW uh, who exposed that the Duma incident was a hoax, essentially, uh, which led to U.S. Uh, airstrikes in April 2018, and uh, what these whistleblowers expose is that the OPCW suppressed evidence that found that the incident was staged, or at least found no evidence that a chemical attack had occurred, which was the pretext for U.S. bombings there. But I, I did think that the fact the Times w- was reporting on that story in Baghouz was something significant and a sign, perhaps, that we're finally going to be seeing some, at least in some areas, sometimes some credible reporting on Syria in the U.S. mainstream. I don't know, Tim, if you had any comments on that. Yes, I do have a comment on that. In fact, I wrote an article about it recently because I was asking um, a a Syrian general who I'd known for some years uh, about that because while it's true that the New York Times exposed the massacre and the cover-up, they immediately went to adopt the backstory, which was that somehow this occurred in the, the fog of war when the US was fighting ISIS. Of course, we know, those of us who studied it long enough know that the US has never been fighting ISIS. It's redirected it in certain ways, but it's never been really fighting it. So, and of course, ISIS was defeated in all the towns and cities of the region, as the late General Soleimani mentioned in November, 2017, um, more than a year before that massacre in Al-Baghouz. So what was going on there? I was asking this general, who had experience in the Derizur region to find out what the US was actually trying to bomb at that time. And it turns out that Al-Bagus, which is a village on the east side of the Euphrates, uh, very close to Al-Bukamal, to the border crossing, I mentioned the one border crossing that Syria, Iran and Iraq control there. The US is controlling the rest of them to divide and rule those uh, those forces there, those independent forces there. Al-Bagus at that time, there was not an ISIS encampment there. There was an SDF, the Kurdish proxies encampment there. The Syrians call it QSD, Qasad. Um, And that is something very similar to what I saw in eastern Syria um, a few months ago. That is to say that the whole of eastern Syria is not the yellow patch where you have the US and SDF there. The Syrian army is deployed all across that region. It's like a hybrid, like in Kamishli City, Hasake City, and Al-Bagus was no exception. There were Qasad. The SDF were in Bagus town and on the outskirts, there was Syrian army um, in some of the outlying civilian areas there. So there was a hybrid there. And what the US was doing there, very similar to what they did in Derizur in 2016, was to try and bomb the areas that were occupied by the Syrian army to get rid of them and deliver full control to their proxy, the SDF in Al Bagus. I mean, I wrote about this one in 2016 where the US Air Force and the Australian Air Force bombed Syrian soldiers, massacred over 120 Syrian soldiers on the mountain behind Derizur Airport in September 2016, precisely to give control of that mountain to ISIS. So ISIS could overlook the airport and supposedly take over the, the city of Derizur. They didn't do that in the end. But the bombing raid 
um, on Syrian soldiers was specifically to help ISIS. One of the most overt, direct means of the US helping ISIS in eastern Syria, um, not just indirectly through their through their allies and proxies in the region. So um, the Al Bagus massacre, it seems, was not at all an anti-ISIS operation. It was trying to get rid of the Syrian soldiers who were there and deliver full control to the the Qasad, the SDF militia in Al Bagus. So I, w- I want to be clear on what you're saying here. You're saying that when the US and the New York Times say that the US was fighting ISIS uh, in that incident, you're saying that that's not true. That's a that's a pretext for actually a phony pretext for actually targeting the Syrian government and its soldiers. Yes, exactly. And their proxy of choice had changed by by 2019 to the SDF. Um, and as I said, the ISIS ha- was fragmented. Uh, in fact, many of them were in the jails of the SDF. And they are still to this day, as many Syrian uh, military people have told me, released from time to time for missions in the desert. That's why I say the US occupation of eastern Syria is providing a safe haven for terrorist groups, not just the SDF, which would collapse without the US occupation, but the ISIS groups, which are sent out um, from the SDF prisons and other areas into the into the Syrian desert, also from Al Tanf in the south there. So the operation in the south in Al Bagus, in an area um, notoriously it's well known to be controlled by the Syrians and the Iraqis and the Iranians, and which is attacked uh, before and uh, before and after that massacre, was uh, the subject of missile attacks from the US, from Israel, to try and uh, dislodge the Syrian Iraqi control of that border crossing. That's that's what the area we're talking about is. It was not an area of ISIS. It's controlled by the Syrian army, but if they can force out in certain areas the Syrian army, they want to allow in the, the presence of this SDF militia. Well, look, in terms of what you're saying about the U.S. not really engaging ISIS in battle, I mean, that tracks again with what I said before about the, the Pentagon's own reports acknowledging this. Uh, let me actually quote you from an article that I wrote uh, last year. Um, it's called, To Keep U.S. Troops in Syria, U.S. Leaders Are Lying Like in Afghanistan. And I'm I'm just, in this passage, you're quoting from the lead inspector general for the U.S. military operations in Syria. So this is what I write. ISIS attacks on U.S. and allied Kurdish forces in Syria, the lead inspector general says, have been, quote, infrequent and generally ineffective, unquote, thereby having a, quote, minimal impact, unquote, on the American-led mission. ISIS, quote, has not carried out any deliberate attacks, successful or otherwise, against U.S. or coalition forces in Syria since January 2019, unquote nearly three years ago. Now, that's interesting, actually, because that tracks with what you're saying about this incident um, where the massacre occurred, because that was in March of 2019, if I remember correctly, and uh, this would cover that period. And I'll just go on here. Whereas ISIS, quote, likely has reduced the priority of attacking U.S. or other coalition forces, unquote, the lead IG report states, the group is, quote, primarily focused on Syrian government regime forces and their allies, unquote, namely Russia and Iran. For ISIS, the, quote, Syrian regime forces and their backers are more accessible targets, unquote. Uh, And then I write, not surprisingly, given that these non-U.S. targets are actually doing the anti-ISIS fighting. Well, it's a conundrum only if you believe in the first place that the U.S. was there to fight ISIS. You know, as as you pointed out, they haven't really... Uh, ever been attacking U.S. forces there. The one time that I think an ISIS missile went into Israel, ISIS apologized to Israel for That's that. Right. That's no, right. But let me push back on one thing here, Tim. Let me push back one thing, because when you say that the U.S. has not been fighting ISIS, the, the response you'd get is that, like, what about Kobani, where the U.S., at least the official story is, and I have no reason to question it unless, unless you do, uh, that the U.S. helped its Kurdish allies defeat ISIS there, including with, with bombing raids. So are you saying that the U.S. has never fought ISIS in Syria or just that, you know, that the extent of that has been massively overblown? Well, yeah, I've been to Kobani, Ayn al-Arab, they call it in Syria. It's a small town. Um, It was occupied by ISIS um, and it's now occupied by the SDF. It sits right on the Turkish border, but is not subject to any attacks by the Erdogan regime in Turkey, which is rather interesting. Um, Now, what happened in Kobani really was that the US replaced one proxy with another. Um, it's notorious that the SDF is is propped up by the by the US. Basically, the the Kurdish proxy 
with the Turkish leadership, by the way, let's remember this accounts for the con you know the tensions between Turkey and and the U.S. government because the uh, the Erdogan government, the Turkish government, generally doesn't like the idea of a base for an, an independent Kurdish state sitting there in Syria to be used as a lever against the the much larger Turk uh, Kurdish population in Turkey. So there are contradictions in the Turkish and the and the U.S. positions there. But Kobani was effectively a substitution of the the Kurdish proxy for the um, for ISIS. And of course, because of what the Trump regime tried to do uh, in, um, uh, in the middle of its term, um, it's now a Kurdish proxy without the US occupation. That is to say, Trump did a partial withdrawal from that part of, of, the, of Syria, of northern Syria. So it's a strange situation. When I was there um, a bit over two years ago, and effectively that region is protected by the Russians and the Syrian army from Turkish forces and the, the the various proxy Islamist groups that that Erdogan uses, and but nominally the SDF has still has administrative control as it does in eastern Syria, but in eastern in northeastern Syria and commercially and Hasake, it is it does it under the supervision of U.S. occupation. All right, Tim. So we're going to wrap. So any thoughts you want to leave us with on Syria? What I want to close with personally is just. It's frustrating uh, being, you know, living in the U.S., being in the West. And, you know, unlike Afghanistan, which, you know, most people heard about, you know, people knew that there was a war there, there were U.S. troops there, there was the uh, debacle around leaving, there was the atrocity, there was the final atrocity of the drone strike that killed those Afghan civilians. Most people, most Americans don't know about Syria. And a, a large problem is just the media's refusal to report on it seriously and to report on what's going on. So if you were to ask most Americans, did you know that there was a multi-billion dollar CIA program using your tax dollars to fund sectarian death squads, fund and armed sectarian death squads, they wouldn't know that. And they also probably wouldn't know about the Caesar sanctions, which are deliberately designed to target Syria's reconstruction. And possibly they won't even know that there's a US troop force there, hundreds of troops occupying uh, a large part of the Northeast and also uh, Altamf as well another area. So any closing thoughts that you want to leave us with? Yeah, you're right. The, the misinformation is uh, comprehensive. It's comprehensive and very deep. And it hits at the self-image, I think, of um, US audiences and Western liberal audiences more generally. They don't want to believe that their state is, uh, uh, even if they've carried out massacres, they don't want to believe that effectively they are the or orchestrators of, of terrorism and destabilization and, and massive um, uh, crimes against humanity. They think that's what the opponents of their state do, basically. But as I said, the the the, the failure of many of the wars in this region is leading to the exact opposite of what the US wanted. So this integration of Syria within the Belt and Road Initiative, the strategic relations between Iran and China and Russia, all of these things are building very, very strongly to the point that the US is effectively reinforcing its own expulsion from the region, which was something that the region began to demand more openly after the assassination of General Soleimani. So I think, uh, unfortunately, I think US audiences are going to be in the dark to the end on this, despite good efforts of yourself and some others there, which are worth maintaining because there are honest and curious people who want to know about what's going on in these wars and the, the connections between these sorts of wars. But I think uh, in terms of the mass audience there, I don't think you're going to be able to compete with the CNNs of the world. They are there to present the, you know, the Justice League and the Superman view of the world, and that's what people like to believe in in the US. So I'm afraid um, it's a difficult task. Tim Anderson, writer, academic director of the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies. His books include The Dirty War in Syria and Axis of Resistance. Tim, thanks very much. Welcome. Welcome.